fraction of the beta zero Shapiro amplitude. Um, so we had uh, some number which we'll come back to. Um, I'll describe that to you in more detail. And then, uh, uh, and then we had um, this function which, which was 2 pi times gamma of minus alpha of s, gamma of minus alpha of t, e, gamma of min uh, minus alpha of u, divided by gamma of minus alpha of s, uh, minus alpha of t, gamma of minus alpha of s, minus alpha of u, and gamma of minus alpha of t, minus alpha of u. Uh, let's remember that alpha uh, was, if I remember right, alpha of x was equal to 1 plus alpha prime by, uh, right, uh, by 4x. And we had sum over alpha was minus 1, sum over minus alpha was 1, uh, coming from uh, s plus t plus u is equal to 4 times m square using the value of m square. These, this was for the tachyons. OK. Now, last time we talked about, uh, uh, we, we were discussing, we, you remember we looked at this formula. And then uh, uh, we looked at the poles of this formula. Do you remember we saw that the poles came at m square equals um, n minus 1 into 4 by alpha prime, which was precisely the sp string spectrum. We saw that the residue of the pole was of degree um, t to the power 2 n. We physically interpreted that as saying that spins up to 2 n were exchanged at level n. And we had an explanation for that. Right, because you looked at the oscillators. At level n, you cannot build spins higher than 2 n. The highest spin came from del x, del x, del x, del x, n times, del x bar, del x bar, del x bar, del x bar, n times. That was the, uh, that's what's by the way called the first rigid trajectory. Um, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should say this. You see, if you look at the spectrum of string theory, um, plotted with respect to, let's say level, maybe it would have been better to do it with respect to mass. but. Uh, Okay, let's do it with respect to level. Mass and level are shifted by one. Okay, and we plot it with respect to spin. What we see is that uh, there is this maximum spin. S is equal to, uh, this line is S is equal to 2n. For the open string, the same line would have been S is equal to n, because there would have been only one oscillator. Okay, so there's this maximum spin here. Um, so given a certain level, you cannot go higher than a certain spin. But there are also trajectories, of course, with lower spin. Right? So as we said, at any given level, all spins from 2s down to 0, actually all even spins, from 2s down to 0. Uh, why even spins? Even spins is just because when you look at uh, two scalars coupling to uh, uh, yeah, some parity kind of thing. But it's, it, it's the following thing. If you look at two scalars coupling to a spin s particle, that three-point function exists only for um, uh, that, uh, they are two identical scalars, that three-point function exists only for uh, um, uh, spin uh, even. Let's take one minute to understand why that, that is the case. You remember that a spin s particle is s mu 1 to mu n. Okay. Now, um, you remember that uh, uh, the most general three-point function between spin, a spin s particle and uh, two scalars, well, these indices have to be contracted. These indices are traceless. Let's, let's call this epsilon. And polarization tends to associate with spin n spin n particle. The indices has to have, have to be contracted. They can't be contracted with each other because they, this is traceless. And they can't be contracted with its own momentum because the equation of motion for a spin n particle tells you that its own momentum dot any one of its 
uh, polarization indices is zero. So they have to be contr contracted with one of the other momenta of the other two particles. And which are the momentum? Well, there's only one choice. K1 is equi equivalent to minus K2 because uh, K1 plus K2 plus K3 is zero, but K3 dotted with the index is zero. So effectively, K1 plus K2 is zero. Okay, so it's nice to choose, canonically to choose this momentum to be K1 minus K2. Okay, so we choose it to be K1 minus K2. So it's K1 minus K2 um, to the power, uh, K1 minus K2 to the power um, mu1 uh, up to K1 minus K2 to the power mu1. Now, the other two, the two scalar particles were identical. So we should get the same answer if we replace K1 by K2. But clearly with this answer, you get minus of the same answer, unless n is even. So it's just that simple. Uh, for that reason, the, the three-point function here is it's unacceptable, inconsistent with both statistics for the scalars, okay, unless n is even. So the only uh, uh, allowed three-point function is a, a three-point function of a scalar particle with uh, uh, with uh, high spin particles, spin s particles, if s is even. Okay, actually one more thing I should say. Let me say that. Um, you think this is the only structure possible for this? This is the only structure possible for uh, spin s particle with, with, it's obvious, right? Because it has to be proportional to the polarization tensor. Has to be a scalar. All momenta, uh, all indices have to contract. What else can it contract with? So it's, Visually obvious that this is the only uh, three-point function, uh, function structure uh, possible. Okay. Uh, now there's something else that uh, that may be making you uncomfortable, uh, and that's this. I keep talking. Can you explain which is symmetric part of the tensor? Exactly, symmetric traceless part of the tensor. I keep talking about these spin s's like that's the only thing that could be possible. And you know, in four dimensions. And for this many indices, trace means any two. Any two indices contracted is zero. It is completely traceless. And I keep talking about these pa these particles as if um, spin is the only thing that's possible. And four dimensions, that's that's basically true. Why is it true? You see, massive particles are classified by their little group. The little group in d dimensions is SO d minus one. In four dimensions, that's SO three, and so massive particles are classified by Angular momentum, J. Just one kartan. One kartan, which you can think of as how many spinners you have to symmetrize to get your representation. That gives you, if you have to spin, uh, symmetrize n spinners, you have J equals n by 2. Or if you're not dealing with half integer spins, as we are currently not, because it's not possible to couple two uh, bosons to one fermion consistent with Lorentz invariance. Okay? If you're dealing with only integer spins, uh, then it's a question of how many vectors you have to symmetrize, traceless symmetrize to get your representation. That's labels all integer spins, right? So in three dimensions, uh, in uh, four dimensions, when SO3 is the little group, um, the only relevant, uh, the only particles, all particles are labeled basically by their spin. However, of course, I want to emphasize that that is not the case in higher dimensions. Let's forget spinorial representations for a while, since we're talking about coupling of two bosons to something. You cannot, in a Lorentz invariant way, couple to a spinner. Okay, um, then you can still have pretty complicated representations. As all of you know, the representation theory of SO, SON is involved. And roughly, but ignoring spinorial representations, all representations can be built up, built up by taking, uh, taking products of vectors. Take products of vectors, Remove all traces always, and then either completely symmetrize or anti-symmetrize. So roughly speaking, although mathematicians won't like it, roughly speaking, you can you can talk about representations of SO, uh, SON in terms of Young tableau, where your indices along rows are symmetrized and indices along columns are anti-symmetrized. And mathematicians won't like it because that's, you're leaving out the fact that you have to take remove traces as well. But we always understand everything is all traces are removed when we draw a Young tableau. That's what we mean. Okay, so now you might think, well, okay, suppose I was in 10 dimensions or 26 dimensions. Spin S particles are this representation. 
with S boxes. Obvious, right? Each of these is one of these indices. But you could also have particles like this, for instance. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing wrong with it. But suppose you had something like this, then all its indices would have to con contract with, with something. And all its indices have only one thing to contract with. That's why it's symmetric. Exactly, namely k1 minus k2. So now if you have even one anti-symmetrized in index, that'll give you zero because you're contracting everything with the same thing. Okay, so the only particles that can propagate when you, sc uh, when you scatter two scalars are these symmetrized things. Okay, note that if you're scattering vector, suppose you were scattering uh, two photons, that would not be the case. So suppose I'm scattering two photons, I have an epsilon one and I have an epsilon two. Okay, and I've got k1 and k2. Now, I still have the epsilon for the spin s particles, but now it has options for what to contract with. You can contract with epsilon one, you can contract with epsilon two, or you can contract with k1 minus k, minus k2. Now there are only two epsilons, right? So that tells us that we cannot have representations with low, more than three rows. Moreover, the number of, sorry, three columns. Yeah, uh, we cannot have columns of length rather larger than three. Moreover, the total number of columns like this, we could have this representation with arbitrary numbers here, or we could have this representation. And everything else is just this. Because you see the epsilons, there are only two epsilons in the game, epsilon one and epsilon two. They could go here, or they could go here. All the rest have to be the momenta. And then there is just the moment. So, you know, the general lesson is this, that if you're sc scattering any particles, external particles with a finite spin, okay, you can always have these front row, these top row x going on forever, and then some finite structure at the beginning. Okay, so up to these things that you can add on, it's a finite number of structures you can, you can have in, uh, in scattering. Okay, uh, however, at the moment we're just talking about scalars, so the only, uh, only quantities that you, uh, that we have were these, these absolutely symmetric high spin particles. Okay, excellent. So, um, so, the, the uh, spins that we see in, in scalar scattering, I'm, I, this is why I labeled this by spin. I really just mean number of symmetrized indices. So we have particles here, we have particles here, we have particles here, and so on. Okay, as we've argued, S can only decrease in the units of two. So this is the, uh, this is the line S is equal to two N. This is the line S is equal to two of N minus one, sorry, N plus one. No, n minus one, s is equal to two, uh, n minus two, and so on. And these lines go on forever, okay? There's no limit to where, where this goes, so it, it just goes on forever, okay? These things are called radial trajectories, these lines. And uh, there is a certain sense in which particles along the same radial trajectory uh, contribute in similar ways to certain processes. Okay, uh, particles along Dreje trajectories have varying mass and varying spin, but uh, along a particular Dreje trajectory have varying mass and varying spin, but have the same spin minus mass, or oh, mass minus spin. Okay, we'll come back to understanding more about Dreje trajectories as we as we move uh, as we move on. Okay, so this was just. Review, we saw that there were poles along these, these, uh, these, uh, these lines and so on. And I asked you guys to look at the large, uh, large S, large T limit of this amplitude, which no doubt you guys have, have done, right? And you found this exponential, exponentially decaying behavior. There's one more large momentum behavior of this amplitude that I wanted to review, uh, which is the sort of, re uh, the so-called Regi limit. Large Exactly. The limit where we're taking S large, S goes to infinity, T fixed. Let's see what happens to this amplitude in this limit. 
Okay. So first, let's look at what what these gamma functions become. So this one becomes gamma of uh, minus one um, minus alpha prime by four s. This is some fixed object. We'll just keep it outside. Gamma of minus alpha t. Okay. This one is gamma of minus uh, one. Almost approximately the same. Yes. With a sign. Yes. Minus alpha prime by four. Now u and u. Um, in fact, let's just use. Let's just exchange this with. Uh, Ga this is gamma of minus uh, plus alpha prime s plus alpha prime alpha t and minus gamma plus minus plus one. Is this correct? Right. Okay. And now we can easily. Uh, alpha t plus one will be negligible. Gamma. Negligible, but you know, inside gamma functions, you have to be a bit careful because it adds a few powers. No, no, it's, it, it might, it might, yeah, it be, might, yeah. might be important. If it gets cancelled, yeah, uh, uh, and it will basically get cancelled, as you will see. So this was uh, um, one plus alpha prime s by four plus this. Okay, then there was the guy that was alpha prime s minus alpha prime u. That's something fixed because it has to do just with t. So there's a gamma of minus alpha prime, I mean alpha, sorry, I keep saying alpha prime, s minus alpha u, we keep that aside. But here we have one guy that grows like, okay, so let's look at this guy. This is not too far from this, because this was fixed. And so this is gamma of minus one, minus alpha prime s by four, Minus minus one minus alpha prime t by four, and this guy is not too far from this. Um, it just has an extra alpha prime t, so one plus alpha prime s by four, and then this alpha t. Okay, this was um, minus alpha t. So plus one plus one. Was this right? Uh, this let's write let's write this out as uh, one plus alpha s. One plus alpha s plus no, nothing. nothing plus exactly one plus alpha s, which is exactly this. Okay, so let's write this as two plus alpha. S. Thank you. Now, as we said, these two more or less cancel with each other. With some additional. With some additional factors. And these two more or less cancel with each other, each other with some additional factors. Okay, now let's work out these additional factors. Let's look at this first. Firstly, um, firstly, let's look at this. So this is also two. Two plus alpha prime s by four plus alpha t. And alpha t, Um, alpha t, um, at least, okay, let us, uh, okay, fine. You see, so what we've got here is gamma of some very large number, okay, times uh, divided by gamma of some very large numbers minus something fixed. Now, approximately, gamma is like factorial. Yeah, so we can take the derivative. It's just that very large number to the power of the fixed number. That ratio is that yes. in a crude approximation. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. So this thing here is approximately 2 plus, And in that 2 plus, I'm ignoring. I hope I'm not making a mistake there. But anyway, uh, I'll come back to it. Uh, alpha prime s by 4 to the power alpha t. What? Yes. Oh, okay. So very large inside oh, the bracket. Two plus alpha prime s by four is the large. Yeah, and because this is a finite power, it's okay to cancel it out. 
Had this power also grown, there would have been the exponential formula. Right, but it's, 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 it's okay. Okay, now let's look at this guy. This was minus 1 minus alpha prime s. These two are the same. And this is greater than this by 1 plus alpha prime t by 4. It goes down. Which is by uh, uh, so 2 alpha t. Uh, it works for this negative argument up to sign. Uh, it, uh, uh, imaginary uh, and you know what you have to think of it is this way. Suppose this was an integer. You would go from this by this by getting many factors of approximately the large number. I, I understand. That's that is true if positive or negative. Okay. Right? Will be minus one to the power some exactly. There will be a minus, minus one to the power. In fact, yes, last class. We had two large negative things and we worked it out. Right? And that's how you get that integral to alpha. I mean, yeah. 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 Sterling's approximation actually works for the analytic function gamma okay. along with modulus of gamma is large. Okay. Modulus of the argument is large. Oh, okay, it's, an, okay, okay, okay. it's an analytic okay, okay. Uh, expression. Okay. Therefore, what we've seen is that we get uh, this behavior for the scattering amplitude. S to the power 2 alpha of t, where alpha of t, as you remember, was equal to 1 plus uh, alpha prime by 40. Okay, so let's write this out alpha prime prime s by 4. And then there is a multiplicative prefactor that we're not keeping track of, but we easily could if we wanted to. Right, alpha prime s to the power 2 uh, plus. Uh, two, uh, two alpha prime t by two. Now let us remember that in a scattering amplitude, t is always negative. Okay, so as t increases, this power here starts out like s to the power two, and then decreases. Now s to the power two is in fact. What another way of getting this s to the power, although it may not be legitimate, but you know s to the power 2 is in fact independently also the behavior in, of the Regi limit of Einstein gravity. I, you compute the S matrix in Einstein gravity and you take the Regi limit and you'll find s to the power 2. Roughly speaking, what you could say is you said alpha prime to 0, yeah? That's a bit suspect because we first took s large and then set alpha prime to zero. The Einstein calculation is first taking alpha prime to zero and then setting S large. These may or may not commute. Okay, but it happens here to be, give you the right answer. Okay, so what we see is that in this, there are two things that are very important about this behavior. Um, and again, we might come back to this as, as we go on. And you, you'll certainly encounter it in your research multiple times. Um, the two things that are very important about this is A, that this growth in physical scattering is bounded. It never exceeds S square. B, <coughs> this S square growth is true not just physically, but in the whole complex scattering plane. Okay, that is this function as, a, as an analytic function of S is bounded at infinity in the whole complex plane. Okay, I want to I want to contrast this with e to the power minus s. E to the power minus s behavior is very rapid decay when s goes to infinity on the complex plane here. But it's very gr rapid growth when s goes to uh, infinity here. Okay, for this reason, when trying to make an uh, arguments about uh, the S matrix as, uh, as an analytic function, it's usually much more, more useful to take the Regia limit than the hard scattering. hard scattering limit. Because the analytic behavior of the hard scattering limit is 
paradoxically enough, not well controlled at infinity in the complex plane. Though it is well controlled because it's a power, it's, the power is the only function that has this property. Right? The, that it's well controlled everywhere uh, at infinity. Yeah. And now this allows us to make precise something I told you about before. I don't know if you remember, but in one of the last class or the previous one, we talked about the following thing. We talked about the, uh, the thing that the, this, this no, this was just S complex S plane at fixed T. The, uh, what the exercise I gave you no. yesterday was S and T both go to infinity at fixed ratio. Mm -hmm. This is T fixed. No, you see, oh, well, I suppose maybe you could. Maybe you could. Um, maybe you could. Uh, but let us now take that finite angle. Uh, there's an order of limits question. Yeah. But let's let's try. Does somebody, one of you have the answer? I can look it up for you. Uh, sorry, uh, what, what, what did you say? Z zeta? Zeta to the uh, two uh, uh, zeta s. Zeta to the power two. Uh, this can be converted to uh, an exponent. Uh, zeta to the uh, s. Uh -huh. zeta, yeah, zeta to the two zeta s uh -huh. uh, times uh, one. Uh, so zeta was a cos squared theta, and now we can uh, shift it to uh, log. Uh, so it will be actually e to the 2 zeta, uh, I mean, I don't. Uh, I okay, I'm, I'm just quoting the formula from Pulchinsky, if you don't mind. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, it went like e to the power. Uh, minus alpha prime s. Uh, minus alpha prime s. Sine squared theta log sine squared theta over, oh, sine squared theta over to log sine squared theta, uh, with the minus, because the log is negative. Uh, he gets e to the power minus s, s, uh, s log s plus t log t plus u log u. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. And then you can write that as uh, e to the power minus alpha prime s uh, f of theta, uh, where, where theta is some, some angle. Okay. Now let's see. Uh, what will, what special happens here if t is held fixed? If t is held fixed, s is almost u but it's almost minus u, okay? And so now, uh, you know, you'll have to worry about these phase things because you'll put u here as minus s and then there'll be the i pi. You'll have to worry about all these phase issues. But approximately the leading behavior, at least the s log, log s behavior is gonna cancel from here, okay? Uh, so, um, what will survive in particular will be a log s to the power something fixed. T. What? It's effectively t. T plus 1. Exactly. And then that will be effectively something like s to the power t. Okay. This we can of course completely ignore. That's roughly speaking this guy. Okay. And what, what's left here, is there a factor of two? Are we getting the factors of two right? Uh, let's see if we get it completely right. Okay, we get e to the power minus alpha prime, uh, s log s uh, plus uh, minus s plus t, uh, and then some, some constant. Uh, uh, what is it? Oof. 4m squared and 4m squared is, okay, uh, plus c, I'm right, let me fix c it. Okay, minus uh, s plus t plus c, log of uh, minus s plus t plus c. Okay, if I can Large ignore difference. the difference between minus here, the pi, if I can some, for some reason ignore that, okay, then uh, one term that definitely survives is the t plus c log, of s. log s. 
So that's s to the power t plus c. Uh, Hey, he's not been too precise. You know, when you say s log s, he's ignored factors of alpha prime and so on. It, at least approximately anyway, you, you get the same thing. You may, you may be missing half of it by taking the limits wrong. Because this is already t Yes, that's what I'm saying. Here, already t infinity is assumed. And then adding c or not adding c. Not adding c is right. No, but I was thinking about the uh, uh, precise power. Uh, we wanted alpha prime t by 4. Um, uh, and here I see alpha prime t. Uh, there, there, there was alpha prime t by 2, then I'm seeing an alpha prime t here at the moment. Uh, I, it could be that the precise power is a bit off because the one that's written in the bracket. Uh, no, but, but what we were trying to do was to take that formula. Exactly. So, I thought, well, uh, okay, let's let's move on. I mean, it's not not a very important question, right? I mean, uh, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, which is to do with uh, this uh, yes. S square like growth. So, in quantum field theory, we uh, learn usually learn that uh, any uh, unacceptable uh, any such growth uh, with uh, large energies is usually unacceptable because that's where our Unitarity is breaking down. The frost on Yeah, and, uh, for example, I'm just thinking of the four perm interaction, uh, which, uh, which you know that uh, some coupling is non renormalizable and that usually gives rise to new physics. So here in string theory, which is uh, a full theory, uh, what does uh, this uh, growth of amp I mean, amplitude uh, at large energy signify? I mean, how is, I mean, just from the scattering picture, uh, how is the unitarity? Uh, yeah. You have to remember that this amplitude here is correct only uh, classically. Because what we did was to compute string three level amplitudes. Yeah. Now, suppose you went very large, large compared to, let's say, Planck scale. What should you expect the actual amplitude to be? You know, the unitarity issue that you're talking about talks about asymptotically high energies. Yeah. Okay, so let's say that you go beyond the Planck. So, you, so suppose you've got two particles and they come and scatter so hard that the two particles that are scattering could be enclosed by a black, black hole uh, before they meet. Okay, so suppose you have two particles separated by B. There will always be some S so that when the two particles come within B, the center of mass energy for them is larger than the black hole that would enclose this. In that case, you can reliably argue, even if you don't know what the low energy theory is, I mean the high energy theory is, you can reliably argue that whatever happens, black hole formation will happen. Because the black hole will form within the validity of classical Einstein GL. Yeah, and at a much below the Planck scale. Presumably. Uh, well, it, the energy will be large compared to Planck scale, but things are separated. I mean, you know, Earth has an energy much larger than Planck scale. Yeah. But, th but there's no problem <laughs> using <laughs> effective field theory for the Earth. <laughs> it's energy densities that matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so much lower energy densities than than this plane. So no 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 uh, uh, issues there. Okay, so uh, in this situation, what do we expect for scattering? Well, you see, once black hole forms, it Hawking radiates, and then the details of Hawking radiation are very complicated. But look, what we're looking at is two to two scattering. What is the chance that a black hole will decay to only two particles? Can somebody give me an estimate? It's constantly, what, what does it do? It constantly produces Hawking radiation. It's constantly yeah. radiating. I mean, it, it, there's always some pair production. I mean, uh, from non perturbative. Always some pair production, yes. but it will keep on happening, right? Yeah. So black hole normally decays to an, a large number of particles. Yeah. It's like radiation, it's like a light bulb, right? Number yeah, of particles I mean, created this much. And when we are making the we are safely. Sure, sure. Much within much reliable. The plan can be so, hello? Hi, Mahan. I, I, I'm teaching a class at the moment, Mahan. Uh, uh, shall I come, come by after, after the class? Yeah, okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, bye. Huh. Yeah, so. Uh, 
But you know, there is some chance, no matter how small, that a big black hole will decay with just two particles. Yes. What is the chance of that? Well, it's extremely... But the two particles will be at high energy because they carry all of the mass. But the chance of that happening will be suppressed by a factor like e to the power minus the entropy of the black hole. Okay? Because this is, the reason that it decays into so many things is that there's a huge amount of phase space involved. The entropy of the radiation. <laughs> this is totally crazy, right? It's crazy by this amount. This is non-perturbative one over Newton's constant. So, what we've just discovered is that the actual 2 to 2 scattering amplitude at asymptotically high energies in any theory of gravity is infinitesimally small. So uh, why does uh, this not uh, tell us this? Uh, because this is purely classical. Why does Einstein not tell us? Einstein's scattering scale is like S square. OK? I see. OK? Uh, Moreover, anyway, there's lots to say about it. But if we, let's 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 uh, let's stop. The classical physics is allowed a certain growth. There's an interesting question of how high that growth can be. Mm. We leave that question aside. But classical physics is not constrained by unitarity, the way you're talking about. Okay, because unitarity is essentially cutting rules. And if you cut a one-loop graph, I mean, you sow two tree levels to get one loop. So it's a completely quantum uh, phenomenon. Yeah, if you ignore the loop graphs, you're throwing out much of the baby with the bathwater, as far as unitarity goes. Okay, so it's a, an interesting question, but there's no clear contradiction. Okay. So if we uh, incorporate higher order corrections, uh, this will be controlled. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, yes, as we, as we said, uh, you will eventually get black hole formation, and this will be infinitesimally small. Oof. Hello? Hel hello? Sorry, wrong number. <laughs> okay, fine. But let's keep going. So we, we, so we, we, we've understood the Regi growth. Now the last thing I wanted to say about this formula uh, was about unitarity, or unitarity to the extent that we can probe it in classical theory. Okay, so what do I mean by unitarity? Well, I, just, I mean just the following. Consider a tree diagram here. Let's first look at it. Um, let's first look at it uh, when these these particles are all scalars. Okay, phi phi psi phi phi. Okay. Now let us suppose that we know the on shell three point function for two fives going to a psi. The on shell three point function we know. Is, uh, is some g. For three scalars, the on-shell three-point function can only be a number. Because s squared, t squared, s, you know, there's no, an k dot k is all something fixed. Okay. I want to know how, what information does the on-shell three-point function tell us, give us, about this off-shell diagram. By, by, by when I say it's off-shell diagram, I mean, of course, the diagram is on-shell, the phi is on-shell. But the, yeah, the guy that runs in the middle is on-shell. That better be because, you know, the uh, on-shell value of a propagator is infinity. Okay. So at first you might think, not much. Because we know the three-point functions, but only on-shell, whereas this guy involves two phi's and an off-shell psi. So how can you use on-shell information to constrain this diagram? But now you start think about, uh, thinking about it a little more. Let's say that the off-shell coupling of phi, phi with psi, whatever it is, let's say that that coupling is, uh, um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna put some, so let's say that the center of mass energy is here, is, is S. Let's say that that coupling is G plus some function of S. We know S is, um, Let's say that this has some mass m square, so s minus m square. We know that this function, whatever it is, vanishes when s is equal to m square. Because that's when the particle goes on shell. On shell is precisely that s is equal to m square where m is the 
uh, mass of the intermediate particle. Okay, so now let's try to build the Feynman diagram that we would get. Feynman diagrams use off shell. Vertices is completely correct. So we will get G plus this into G plus H of. What? Is this modulus and near is the length square? Uh, okay. And G into some function which is one S is the length What? Sorry, say, uh, divided by S minus one. You're asking is it small? Yes, because this modulation could have been g into h, where h is one at h little dimension. We could, it could have been that, could have been that. But it, so this, is just this h is completely anything. Oh. So we're not making any uh, uh, any assumption. Okay. H could be g times something else. Okay. Now this is an arbitrary function of s minus m squared t, but we know that when s is equal to m squared it vanishes. We also, let us assume that everything in our Lagrangian is analytic. You know, as is reasonable. Then, this will have a Taylor series expansion in S minus M squared. Okay, so what do we get? We get G squared divided by S minus M squared plus S mi plus this, you know, when, when we expand at least one factor of H, exactly, which starts from S minus M squared. And so this other factor, whatever it is, has no pole is entirely analytic. So what have we concluded? What we've concluded is this, that although we cannot completely con compute the, uh, completely compute the contribution of the exchange of psi to this diagram from the on-shell three-point function, we can conclude one thing about it. We can reliably compute the residue of the pole. And this is a generic thing. In fact, if you think about it, even the question of what this exchange diagram contributes, let's say in a gauge theory, is ambiguous. Because how much is an exchange, how much is the exchange part and how much is the contact part is not gauge invariant. If you do the calculation in Einstein gravity, for instance, where the thing being exchanged is a graviton, you work in Lorentz gauge. That will give you one part which comes from exchange, another part which comes from contact. You work in some other gauge, it could redistribute this. The final answer is gauge invariant. But individual diagrams are not. But precisely because the difference between two exchange diagrams has to co cancel between the dis difference between two contact diagrams. And contact diagrams have no propagators, they're just analytic. The difference between two, two exchange diagrams has to be analytic. And so cannot affect the pole part. So the only real, you know, so the question of how much comes from this particle exchange is not even really well stated question. But the question of what is the pole is a completely well posed question. And that is precisely given by the on shell three point function. In fact, this statement is an example of Kutkowski's rules, slightly trivial example of Kutkowski's rules for classical theory. Okay, because Kutkowski's rule is the following. In order to compute the imaginary part of a scattering amplitude, what you're supposed to do is cut the amplitude. Then you're supposed to replace that propagator by a delta function. Okay, one by p squared, s minus m squared, should go to delta of s minus m squared. That should give you the imaginary part of the amplitude. But now, suppose the particle, this thing has a pole, and we have to put in the minus i epsilon correctly. What is the imaginary part of this? It's delta of this, with some two pi's which will come right. So once again, but Kutkowski's rules tell you that the imaginary part of the amplitude, not the whole amplitude, but the imaginary part of the amplitude is entirely given by on-shell data. Right, because, so once again we're saying that the pole, the residue of the pole is entirely predicted by the on-shell three-point scattering. Is this clear? So this is the content of so-called quote-unquote unitarity in a classical theory. That the residue of the pole is the product of three-point functions. And then when they're indices, they're souped up versions of the statement, but that's always true. But the full propagator can't be known. The full uh, uh, diagram cannot be obtained. Okay. And as we said, it's not even always meaningful to ask what the full diagram is in 
you know, without taking into account other things. Okay, so now this is the thing we're going to try to test in string theory. So we can't know this analytic part. The analytic part, you know, we've got the full answer. The question of how this relates to some exchange part and something else, that becomes ambiguous except for the pole part. The answer is unambiguous. Okay. So now this comes to carefully looking at the constants in uh, uh, the rest of the diagram. Uh, so I told you that we got some 2 pi times product of gamma functions. In addition to 2 pi when you do the integral, you get some factors that come out of calculation which are which are, uh, how bad are they? Some 8 pi if I remember. Eight pi i by alpha prim, alpha prim, yeah. Eight pi i by alpha prim. I may have been put there for fun. <laughs> so that, uh, but there's, uh, there's an integral that gives you eight, eight pi by alpha prim. If you do the calculation. Okay, and then there are unknown factors. What are these unknown factors? This is very important to understand. You see, what we are computing is this. What we're trying to compute is the sum over world sheets that do this. Okay, it's very important to understand. I think we've emphasized this before, but it's very important to understand we're not compute this. We converted into. by doing the state oper operator map for these tubes. And then we got that we replaced these by the corresponding vertex operators. Okay, but you know, there are two things. Firstly, there is an unknown factor associated with each vertex operator. Why is there an unknown factor? The unknown factor, one way of thinking of it is that every time you eat out a hole out of the world sheet diagram, the topological part of the string amplitude picks up an extra phase. Do you remember this? Do you remember that in on the string world sheet, in addition to what we talked about, there was this thing square root g times r. And just the order of Right. Which gave us this factor, total number of handles, but when there were holes, total number of handles plus holes. Okay? So each of these is eating out a, a hole. And you know, when we when we send this guy in. It could be that we're supposed to associate some unknown numbers with each of these, these objects. This unknown number, actually the relative normalization of these numbers is fixed by the state operator map. Because you, what we're doing is putting some state on here, then the transition between the state and uh, uh, this map, maybe there's something unknown, Let associate for instance with the number of holes, some, some factor like that. But this will not affect how the thing oscillates. So the state operator map gives you reliably with, norm with, with normalizations, relative normalizations of the vertex operators you have to put here for different states. But there's an absolute normalization which we'll leave, we'll leave, we'll be sort of ignorant about. So let's say that we had four tachyons. I'm going to say let gt be the absolute factor for each tachyonic external state. Okay, so this whole thing now is going to be multiplied by gt to the power 4. In addition, what we computed was the, the correlation function. Thinking of this 2D conform, uh, world sheet as a field theory. We use Wick's theorem and so on. Now those are the rules for computing, not the path integral, but the path integral of with the insertions divided by the path integral with nothing. Okay? Overall normalization the, the, exactly. So there is an overall factor of just the sphere partition function with no insertions that we've not kept track of. So really, we should be doing this times CS2 where CS2 is the determinant 
of the Welsh sheet theory on the sphere, whatever it is. And then there's gt to the power 4. OK? Good. This was for the four-point function. However, we also computed three-point functions. We also computed three-point functions. We, I'll get the numbers straight in a moment. But the three-point function had a g, then would have come with the gt to the power 3, because there were three such insertions. But also one factor of cs2, because the three-point function also had the sphere partition function. OK? And when we computed the three-point function, we basically just got one, right? Uh, I think we just got one because it was just a delta function. Okay, I maybe I maybe got, got one or two factors wrong, but okay. So we get this times one. Now what we're supposed to do is this: this object had a pole corresponding to the tachyon exchange term. Do you remember we had a formula last class for the residue of that pole? Uh, can somebody, does somebody have the notes? It is S into some polynomial divided by S minus. Uh. Divided, and then there was there's some polynomial in T of degree to n. Does somebody, can somebody reproduce that for me? One plus alpha of T, two plus alpha of T, up to n plus alpha. Ah, great. Alpha of T, the whole thing square. Now let's set n is equal to 0. At that point, there's only one state to exchange, namely the tachyon. Is this clear? OK. Now, if n is equal to 0, um, this ends at 1 plus alpha of t. No, no, should have ended at. Ah, uh, it is, sorry, ends at 0 plus alpha of t because n was 0. Okay, so this coefficient was just 1 in that special case. It was 1 times this. Okay, so, uh, right, a, 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 also the scalar should just be constant. Okay, so there we get s minus 1 of 4 by alpha prime plus uh, into n minus 1 by 1. So the pole part is something that we isolate. Okay, this whole thing multiplies this. But that whole thing has to be equal to this thing. The coefficient has to be equal to this thing square. Okay, and so we conclude that CS2 times GT uh, cube, the whole thing square has to be equal to CS2 times GT to the power 4 times some known numbers. I'm not keeping track of known numbers if you've not done it very carefully. But some 2 pi's and so on. This tells you that CS2, for instance, this allows us, for instance, to solve for, because here C, 1 power of CS2 appears, but here 2 powers of CS2. This allows us to solve for CS2 in terms of GT. Okay, so this tells us that CS2 is equal to some number divided by GT square. If unitarity is correct, this is the only reasonable value to associate with the CS2. Okay, now once we've done this, we now have a test. So far, uh, so far we've not, we've not done much just related to unknown numbers. But now we have a test, because now everything is written in terms of one number, namely uh, gt, let's say. Okay, now we have independently computed, let's say, tachyon, tachyon, 
graviton three point function. That was one of the first calculations we did. Now what we can do, and we also computed tachyon, tachyon, dilaton, and tachyon, tachyon, B field. Now we can, what we can do is to go and look at the massless pole. What runs in the massless pole? The only things that run are tachyon, tachyon, graviton, tachyon, tachyon, dilaton, and tachyon, tachyon, B. Actually, B doesn't run because uh, wait, wait, one B. Exactly. You can't. Ex you can only exchange uh, sp uh, symmetric spins. So the only thing that ex runs actually is the graviton and the dilaton. Okay, graviton is spin two, dilaton is spin one. How do we isolate out the the graviton and the dilaton? Well, I told you, right? If you have a spin zero particle exchange, the coefficient of that has to be a constant. On the other hand, if you have a spin a spin uh, two particle exchange, the coefficient of that has to be this Gegenbauer polynomial of degree two. Just symmetry fixes that. So you can take this and decompose it into the graviton exchange and the dilaton exchange. I'm not going to do it for you. It's a bit, bit of work. But you can take that and do that. Okay? And thereby compute the actual coefficient that comes before graviton scattering, behind graviton scattering, and the coefficient that comes behind. Uh, uh, dilaton scattering. Now let's see the nature of the uh, of the equation we're going to get by doing this. The left hand side stays the same. It's g t to the four times c s square. Sorry, times c s times some known number. Now that has to be equal to what? C s times g t squared g. Let's say graph. The whole thing square. So if this is going to work, if this is going to work, okay, then you see um, this gives us uh, gt to the four, gt to the four cancels, cs, uh, cs cancels. But yes, yeah, cs gh mu nu, the whole thing squared is equal to something known. That's some numbers. That will give us g h mu nu, uh, g h mu nu in terms of CS and therefore in terms of GT. Yeah, everything is determined in terms of this. Everything is determined uh, square is equal to some number times GT square. But now we have a check. Because we independently know what, what this g h mu nu is in comparison with GT from the state operator map. Meaning the relative normalizations of vertex operators are fixed by the state operator. Okay, so this number that comes out of unitarity must match the number that comes out of the state operator. That works. In fact, it works at every level. I'll outline a general proof of the statement as we go along. Moreover, there are many more checks because, for instance, this amplitude, this amplitude involving two gravitons and a tachyon. Sorry, a gravi uh, two tachyons and a graviton, also shows up in some other. Suppose we have h mu nu t with t exchange. That involves the same three point function. Okay? Uh, uh, so getting the pole right here. Once, you know, let's say we didn't believe the state operator map. Uh, operator map. This will give us some principle to fix what GH means. But now it's fixed. It's also fixed here. And then the pole has to match. You know, independent, with no more, no further convention choice. So putting other particles on, on the external shell is another consistency thing. Does it all work? Okay. Experimentally, you can compute string scattering amplitudes and go around and check that it works. But of course, what we want is a general proof that this will always work. Now, for tree level and maybe at one loop, this proof has been understood forever. There's a part of Wolchinsky that explains roughly how it works. But the, the corresponding analog of this statement that also in loop amplitudes, the cutting rules, unitarity works, was only worked out last year by Ashok, Ashok Sen. 
Okay? But now we have a full proof that once we fix one or two ambiguous things, like see what CS2 is, the rules of strings, string theory are such that all of these unitarity checks work. This is an incredible accomplishment, I want to, I want to emphasize. Okay? So the rules that we've outlined for string, for string scattering amplitudes are provably consistent with unitarity. Okay, so you have finite scattering amplitudes for gravitons at the complex, at the quantum level, reducing to Einstein's equations at low energies, finite, no infinities, no ambiguities, and completely consistent with the cutting rules, the rules of unitarity. Okay, this is a very non-trivial accomplishment. Why is it so non-trivial? You see, the non-trivial thing about this is this, that it's very hard to take gravity and cut it off. See, the problem with gravity amplitudes, I mean, it's not even about the renormalizability. Re the problem with gravity amplitudes, like many field theory amplitudes, is that when you compute, you get infinity. Now, it's just very hard to take that gravity. The first step in trying to make sense of these infinities is to be able to regulate the theory. And regulate the theory in a gauge invariant way. It's very hard to do that in gravity. You see, in a scalar theory, you can do anything dumb. You put a momentum cutoff. Momentum cutoff is never a good thing in a gauge theory because nonlinear gauge transformations mix high momenta and low momenta. Okay, so putting a momentum cutoff is a, ga a gauge non invariant thing to do. In gauge theories, there was this beautiful way of actually doing it by going to the lattice. Lattice the gauge theory, Wilson's lattice case theory, gives you a beautiful gauge invariant way of regulating the theory. Also dimensional regularization. Dimensional regularization does, it's true. It's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. Dimensional Maybe regularization. Oh, it was first. Uh, yes, dimensional regularization was the one that was first, first discovered. I, I agree with that, I agree with that. But you know, it's a bit of a mathematical trick. For instance, yeah. it's not clear that the, what to do outside perturbation theory for dimensional regularization. Because dimensional regularization is a way of giving Feynman diagrams meaning when they're divergent. Suppose you've got some instant on cat. It's not so clear what to do. Right? Where, where is, where is lattice gauge theory? It's a completely non-perturbative thing. You know, what, what is to be done is, is clear. Okay. Now, if you try to do the same thing in gravity, um, in any crude way, for instance, a, a, gauge, a, 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 a lattice gauge theory won't work because that breaks, breaks diffeomorphism invariance. You know, having any structure in space-time breaks diffeomorphism variance. Um, it's true that dimensional regularization works, but what we want to do is to take the theory and modify it in a way to make it, uh, well, I suppose it's true that dimensional regularization works in, in perturbation theory. Uh, but you know, that will violate unitarity. It'll have very high, very high growth. If you just try to take Einstein gravity and dimensionally regulate it, at least you're in grave danger of violating unitarity because the amplitudes will just keep growing higher, higher and higher, higher and higher, as I you mean, go to higher and higher loops. The thing with uh, gravity being non-renormalizable is that you, I mean, in a very old language, you need an infinite amount of counter terms, and you cannot r regulate the uh, or control the theory with any finite. I mean, that, that's what the essential. Well, but you know, if you say, "My, I'm going to take every in, every integral and regulate it with dimensional regularization." There are your counter terms. That prescription defines implicitly defines a set of counter terms, which is one set, one infinite set of counter terms. But this won't be a good set of counter terms because it'll give give rise to amplitudes that go faster and faster and faster with energy uh, as you go to higher and higher loop order. I, I think you'll, you'll be in strong danger of violating unitarity because uh, you go to twentieth loop order and it'll grow like s to the twenty, roughly speaking. Okay. Hard to believe that that defines a consistent quantum theory. On the other hand, in string theory, we have amplitudes that order by order in perturbation theory finite, well behaved, decay at large s, or never grow too large, okay, and obey all the rules of unitarity. Why, why is this unitarity so important? It's important because if you try to do something that violates gauge invariance, 
and just shut your eyes and do it, how will the theory hit you back? It will hit you back by violating unitarity. Right? Why, why is that? It's the same thing we saw in string theory. Um, you know, uh, we, you see, how do we know that a gauge theory is unitary? Well, we know that a gauge theory is unitary because there is one gauge, namely a Coulomb type gauge, in which it's manifestly unitary. It has only physical degrees of polarization. How do we know that a gauge theory is Lorentz invariant? We know that it's Lorentz invariant because there's another gauge, namely Lorentz gauge. <laughs> <laughs> in which it's manifestly uh, uh, Lorentz invariant. How do we know it's both unitary and Lorentz invariant? There's no gauge that displays these two things manifestly. But gauge invariance ensures that it is the case because answer don't depend on gauge. Okay? We encounter the same structure when we're studying string theory, if you remember. We studied string theory in the light cone gauge where it was manifestly unitary. And we studied it in conformal, you know, the Spolyakov way, in which case it was manifestly Lorentz invariant. But there was no gauge in which both were true. We had to work hard to prove the no-ghost theorem in conformal gauge. But if we'd done, done everything right, it was sort of guaranteed from the beginning that both were true because of, these were just different gauges, and one gauge this was true. Now, if you violate, if you work in a Lorentz invariant gauge, and you're not careful to preserve gauge invariance, well, there will no longer be equivalent to, to quantizing the theory in the manifestly unitary gauge, and therefore will violate unitarity. And that's typically what will happen. Typically, this is where attempts to make quantum theories of gravity of any sort fail. To have unitarity and Lorentz and then you know, all the good symmetries together is very hard. That string theory does it is an incredible accomplishment. It's a very old accomplishment. But it's still an incredible accomplishment, and uh, this is something we should not forget. We should not forget because, you know, despite all this duality and ads EFT and so on, there is a core of string theory that is, in a way, still the, one of the central accomplishments of the field. And that is just constructing S matrices for gravity that have all these beautiful properties. Without that, we would be in shaky ground in everything we said. I have a sort of uh, yes. A related question. Yes. Obviously, about string perturbation theory, so uh, I don't know whether uh, this is uh, so. Uh, in even in uh, conventional quantum field theory, in the Feynman diagram expansion, I mean that's at best a, uh, an asymptotic expansion. Mm. Uh, and in string theory, I think uh, at some point Gross and Fedeval had shown that uh, the string perturbation theory uh, diverges in the sense that it's uh, not even uh, Borel solvable. Uh, so. I was uh, wondering uh, how to, I mean, obviously it's uh, probably finite uh, order by order, but if we actually try to make uh, sense of uh, the whole string perturbation theory, yeah. uh, I, I don't know what the question is, but I mean, how, yeah, yeah. About, uh, 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 it's a very good question. And uh, let me just remind you how it goes. What, I'll just put some formulas to what you said. Suppose in field theory, you have uh, g to the power 2n, and you have a, a n. It's a typical like, kind of expansion for some quantity. The law anyway is that a n grows like n factorial. OK. Um, this is typical field theory like behavior. This leads, this when you Borel sum, Basically, the, the Borel transform takes the n factorial away, roughly speaking, and gives you a, uh, gives you a, uh, gives you a, uh, a function with some finite radius of convergence, whose singularities have physical interpretations. For instance, instant terms. Okay, and the fact that the poles occur at particular values of g square tell you that instant terms are effects that are e to the power minus one by g square. Okay, in string theory, theory, as you said, what these guys showed is that this went like 2n factorial. Okay, now what this does, you see, n factorial is like n to the n, 2n factorial to leading order is like n to the part 2n. What this does is to say that whatever happened with g square earlier will happen with g here. So, 
The real implication of this is that when you do something like a Borel sum, with the, the analog, you'll have to divide by 1 by 2 and factorial, so you have to do something like Borel sum with something else. What you should expect is singularities, you know, non perturbative effects that go instead of going like minus number by g square, will go with like ni minus number divided by g. And for a long time, people had no clue what this was until the discovery of d brains. d brains are precisely objects whose tension scales like g. D brains are the things that make sense of the uh, of the uh, singularities of the analog of the Borel sum in string theory. Okay, so the, you can sort of try to make non-perturbative statements from all orders of perturbation. Yeah, so it's a good situation, not a not a bad one. Okay, uh, excellent. Let's 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 keep going. Okay, now uh, this is all I wanted to say about closed string scattering, except for a few remarks that I will just. Uh, make for you, so we won't spend the time to do the calculations. I'm not, yeah, you, you, you probably remember that we understood uh, lots of three-point functions in type two theory. Okay, the calculation for four-point functions is about as easy. The only issue, the only complication is the only real essential complication is that there is no. Uh, uh, there's no analog of the tack here. So the lowest, which is a physically a good thing, <laughs> but it's bad for textbook exercises because <laughs> tachyon is so easy to compute scattering amplitudes for. But then there's no analog of the tachyon out there. So the lowest, the simplest thing that you want to do is actually the physical thing, namely let's say four graviton scatter. Now because the outside particles have indices, okay, the weak contractions involved in doing that is a little more work. Okay, so it's a little more painful. I'm not going to actually do it in class, but I'll just quickly tell you what the answer is. Uh, it's actually very, very similar. So you do the contractions, you get some, some epsilon structures dotted with k's, and then what remains is an integral over the world sheet, very similar to the one that we had for the tachyon and bosonic string theory. As you will see, the answer is also very similar. I'm going to write out the whole thing just so that you see it once. If minus uh, pi i g c square. Okay, doesn't matter about this. This is the g open to the power four. I'm not writing these constants. Let me write, write it as with everything else. Uh, gamma of minus 1 by 4 alpha prime s. So this is the thing that replaces that minus alpha of s. Okay, Because there was no shift by 1, no tachyon, then 1 has gone away. Okay, Gamma of minus alpha prime t by 4, gamma of minus alpha prime u by 4, okay, times gamma of 1 plus alpha prime by 4 s, gamma of 1 plus alpha prime by 4 t, gamma of 1 plus alpha prime by 4 u. This is the analog of the gamma of u plus alpha, alpha u plus alpha t without a, one of the ones, exactly, okay? This is the function. Now the whole function comes multiplied by an index structure because we're sc scattering four objects with indices, okay? And the index structure is the following. It is um, okay. Uh, T, sorry, I have to look up what his T was. Let's 
سر اینجاست بازه Okay, let me write it down and then I'll find it. It's P of mu 1, uh, there should be 8 indices, yes, uh, nu 1, mu 2, nu 2, uh, okay, yeah, uh, mu 3, mu 3, mu 4, mu 4 and then T of rho 1, sigma 1, rho 2, sigma 2, rho 3, sigma 3, rho 4, sigma 4. Now I've written something with, with uh, 16 indices but then I'm contracting it with the following. Product i is equal to 1 to 4. Epsilon i for the ith particle, okay, uh, mu i rho i, okay, and k i nu i k i rho i. When this t is some particular particular tensor, okay. So, so this whole thing multiplies this. Now I have to find the definition, his definition of T, just one second. Uh, mm -hmm. Where is T? Just one second, sorry. Ah, and now his definition of M, one last minute, sorry. Spandu. Important, I'm teaching a class. No, okay, bye. You know what's going on is this. Well, his definition of T is very implicit, I'll tell you what it is. Consider F i is equal to del i F i mu nu is del mu, let's say k i mu epsilon i nu minus k i nu epsilon i mu. Okay, so the field strength for a photon of polarization epsilon associated with particle i. Yeah. Okay, now consider the following object. It's a very implicit definition, but okay. Um, Consider the following object for F1, F2, F3, F4. You multiply field strengths as matrices and trace. Okay. In the mu nu indices. The mu nu indices. Okay, you multiply them as matrices. Mu nu minus. F1 minus trace F1, F2, trace F3, F4. 
okay and 1 by 1 by 8 of this and here what we have done is to give uh, uh, f1 and f2 a special rule okay so plus two permutations okay so f1 f3 f okay that quantity is some is some object which by definition is written as t mu 1 Whoa. T mu mu nu uh, rho sigma rho uh, 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 no, sigma rho alpha beta nu delta. I'm sure there's a better way to write this, but anyway, okay, let's 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 go with this. K one mu epsilon one nu, K two rho epsilon two rho, K three sorry sigma rho alpha. K, Epsilon three, beta, and K four, yeah, N nu and epsilon four delta. Okay, right, so you take this; it's clearly proportional to four epsilons and four k's because it's made out of four f's. You put whatever, write it in this form. The coefficients of that are this t. Okay, so it's a very roundabout definition. It's just a bunch of delta functions, right? Delta mu nu is that kind of thing. This epsilon is a polarization. This epsilon is a, it's a polarization. Now here they are graviton polarization, so they have two indices. But that tensor is defined by this algebraic thing. This being equal to this defines the tensor. And then you have to take take, take this tensor, take another copy of that tensor, now multiply by this stuff. Okay, you see by the way that it's roughly doing the following. It's, uh, um, anyway, yeah, it's not too far from squaring what you would get from photons. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm, the closed string is just product of two open strings for yeah. that. Yes, 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 it's not exactly, I mean, but. In a very heuristic way. Very close, and the, in fact there is this famous paper by Kawai, KLT, Kawai someone and Tai, explaining that all string amplitudes, all, uh, Closed string uh, amplitudes uh, have very tight connection with squares of open string amplitudes. It's not completely obvious when you look at the calculation, but it's true. Okay, but for now, since we've got Rajiv Gavai's colloquium coming up, let us quickly just, this, this is the answer I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to show you. Where are the, this part, it's completely analogous to what we studied, the bosonic string. This part is separate. It's some polarization structure. Turns out that this polarization structure is exactly the same polarization structure as you get from scattering four gravitons in Einstein theory. Okay, so type two string. Type two super gravity. Yeah. But you know, well, let's take all of these to be completely symmetric. Okay. Then, just in pure Einstein gravity. Okay, just pure. Just four graviton scattering in Einstein gravity has a certain polarization structure outside it. That polarization structure is exactly the same as what appears in type two supergravity. Uh, this is totally non-trivial because you know there are many independent possible polarization structures, and most the most general theory should have had one polarization structure times one function plus another polarization structure plus another. Yeah. Type two superstring theory is very sp very simple. It's just got one overall polarization times one function, which is very similar to the tachyon scattering amplitude in the bosonic string. So in some sense, type the, uh, the tachyon scattering amplitude in the bosonic, the uh, massless scattering amplitudes in the bosonic, in the type two string, are roughly as simple as tachyon scattering amplitudes in the bosonic string. Basically because you're able to just overall take out the uh, index structure. This is actually a consequence of supersymmetry. But uh, supersymmetry. You know, the fact that this is this index structure that had to appear is a, uh, uh, can be shown from the high degree of supersymmetry, space-time supersymmetry of type two theory. And in fact, it's not true in the heterotic string. Uh, when you do the, when you compute the similar quantity, four gravitons scattering in the heterotic string, do you know what you get? Here you got the product of two structures that look like photon, two photon structures. In the heterotic string, you get exactly the same structure except that one of them is photon scattering in the, in the superstring, 
and the other photon sc scattering in the bosonic string. Now you remember that three, three photons scattering in the bosonic string is much more complicated than three photons scattering in the superstring. And because of that, you get many different, you take that and multiply it, you know, the sort of three structures in the photon scattering amplitude of the bosonic string, one structure in the superstring. So you get essentially three structures in the, in the heterotic graviton. On the other hand, when you do graviton graviton scattering in the bosonic string, you get three times three. So you get nine different structures. So graviton scattering in the bosonic string, it's very complicated. See, these different structures are not very different. I mean, they're still roughly speaking some complicated thing times one function of gamma functions, one gamma function. But that, that complicated thing involves S, starts involving S and T in some non-trivial way. And so it gets complicated. So gravitational scattering amplitudes in the bosonic string, if you just look at them, you just eyeball them, they look significantly more complicated than the tachyon scattering amplitude. Heteronic string, somewhat more complicated. Super string, roughly as complicated. And the important thing is that the S, the pure STU dependence is purely here. All this is the is is basically polarization dependences. Okay, fine. Uh, everything we said about uh, high energy behavior of the bosonic string scattering amplitude, regia behavior, poles continues to work for type two theory. Okay, and uh, so this this the, the, this is where I propose to end my, our discussion of tree-level scattering of closed strings. In the next lecture, we will start studying tree-level scattering of open strings. We will start studying open strings more seriously than we have before, and we'll encounter one uh, qualitatively new feature, namely these chan patent factors and non-abelian dynamics uh, at associated with open strings that we'll do next lecture. Okay. <coughs>